Good afternoon. It is a pleasure and a deep honor to welcome you all here to Barnard. In the past weeks and months, the question of women's lives, women's work, and women's leadership has lurched into sudden prominence. We have seen a surge of attention, both in the media and in classrooms, coffee houses, and street corners around the country, paid to the question of how working women juggle their lives and whether certain family complications disqualify women from certain kinds of professional engagements. It's been a rather odd onslaught of attention at many levels, because of course working women have been quietly juggling their lives for decades now, raising their children, going to work, and dealing with the sexism that confronts them each and every day. Their sexism is not necessarily a public sexism, a sexism that can be derided and exposed but a much more virulent sexism composed of the basic factors of discrimination and unequal pay. Theirs is a sexism, as today's GAO report discloses, where equality in the workplace does not exist and where federal laws to, designed to ensure this equality are neither monitored nor enforced. Forty years ago, women at Barnard College, at Wellesley, and at great institutions across this country took over buildings and marched in the streets to demand the most basic of equalities, equal pay, equal access, and equal rights. Today, it would seem as if we've come so far. Women are in medical and law school, in Wall Street firms and Hollywood studios, and coming closer than ever to seizing the highest reins of power. Yet, as the GAO report describes, women across this country still face the kind of inequities that should have disappeared long ago, discriminatory working conditions and unequal pay. These concerns do not always get the greatest attention from the media. They are not the stuff of front page stories or Saturday Night Live skits. But they are the seedy reality of what it all too often means to be working and female in America. Thankfully, the four women here with me today have fought long and hard to change these conditions and to bring them to the attention of the American public. It is my distinct pleasure, therefore, to introduce you to our speakers for this afternoon. Anna Oliveira. Sonia Osorio, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, and Senator Hi Hillary Rodham Clinton. And Myrtle Reagan, who just came in. Delighted to have you. <laughs> Thank you. We begin with Anna Oliveira, President and CEO of the New York Women's Foundation and a fierce fighter for all women's rights. Hi. Good afternoon. And, um, First of all, we want to congratulate President Sparr for having this event here today. And certainly, um, our, you know, have a life debt to our fierce leaders, Congresswoman Maloney and, of course, Senator Clinton, um, as well as all the other activists that I know are here. Um, as uh, president of the New York Women's Foundation, I frankly stand on the shoulders of our grantee partners, who are actually the women in the institutions who work to make the difference. I would like to spend two minutes just talking a little bit about the relevance of the economic issues in women's lives, and particularly equal pay and other, um, I would say, income supports as well as legislation attempts, particularly in New York State, that are of critical importance. The foundation had the fortune of um, releasing a report recently in part of women's policy related in, in Washington, D.C., that shows the New York State, in spite of its great resourcefulness, human resourcefulness, economic resourcefulness, and its diversity, its diversity of communities, its long history, that women in New York State now are more likely to be poor than they were 20 years ago. That um, most women in the state are doing worse. Some of us in managerial positions, professional uh, positions, and owners of women's businesses as a whole are doing better. But most of us are not. In addition to that, um, the discrepancies among women, because we're not a monolithic group, um, paint a worse picture and call further the attention to the need for uh, equality, for the need for fairness. For instance, although women as a whole in New York State earn about 78.4 cents to the dollar of a man's pay, uh, that difference is much more stark if we look at subgroups of women. For instance, African American women are about 66 cents to the dollar. Native American women at about 60 cents to the dollar. Latinas at 56 cents to the dollar. Um, that's just one particular example. We also find that um, 
New York State as a whole, the labor market participation of women has declined relative to where it was 20 years ago, relative to other states. Can you believe that in the United States with our amount of wealth in the state, we fall at 40%, 40th place in uh, the level of poverty? Um, and you know, I do want to make a comment that the federal measurement of poverty is a woefully inadequate measure. However, it permits us to compare throughout the country. That's why we're using it at this point. Um, more than ever, efforts to, uh, for equal pay, for support of women continuing successfully in the labor force are of critical importance. And you know, I know we're very present to the particular financial crisis that the US and New York City and the financial establishment are going through. We must remember that in times of financial vulnerability, those who are already vulnerable suffer the most. So what we see, for instance, is that in New York, in New York City, and in the state, the brunt of the mortgage crisis is really for female single-headed households who comprise two-thirds, almost two-thirds, about 60% of the families living in poverty in the state. So uh, we look at women's issues certainly as women's issues and worthy in and of themselves because we are women. But we also look at women's issues because they're all of our issues. They are family issues, they are community issues, they are the whole country's issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anna. We turn now to Merville Regan, Executive Director of the Women's Center for Education and Career Advancement and a leader who has been working for over three decades to create greater opportunities for low-wage workers in both the public and private sectors. Merville. Thank you very much for this opportunity today to talk about pay equity issues. I'm happy to represent the work of the Women's Center for Education and Career Advancement, which has worked for nearly 40 years to address the needs of women in New York City who have a marginal and uncertain foothold in the paid labor force. Our work has helped more than 40,000 women in New York City achieve economic security. And our recent work has helped over 400 not-for-profit and social service agencies in New York City better serve and improve their capacity to serve low-wage workers through the self-sufficiency standard for the city of New York, which measures what it costs to live and work in New York City, depending on the borough in which you live and the number of children and their ages in your family. We developed the self-sufficiency standard in, in 2000. In 2002, we developed the self-sufficiency calculator. And through our work, we have helped hundreds of thousands of families and low-wage workers served by the 400 organizations that use the self-sufficiency calculator. So we have a pretty good sense of what, not only what it costs to live and work in New York City, but also how many families are working full time and aren't earning enough money to meet their basic needs. What are some of the problems faced by women and people of color in today's workplace? You heard Anna talk about some of the percentages vis-a-vis -vis women of color in New York City. And those are startling and shocking numbers and women do bear the brunt of these issues. Wage discrimination occurs all across the United States of America, and it occurs when women are paid less because they're not considered primary breadwinners, when women are hired less frequently in high wage jobs, when they're given fewer training and mentoring opportunities than other workers, when they're given smaller benefits and pension packages than men working in the same jobs, Compensation discrimination occurs when an employer sets the wage for jobs held mainly by women below that of jobs that are held mainly by men. This kind of discrimination is already prohibited in our country. The wage gap continues, however, to be a problem. What is the effect on women workers over a lifetime? Not only lower wages, but less purchasing power, less economic power, less likelihood of economic self-sufficiency, higher rates of poverty, poor standard of living during retirement, and just loss of wages over the course of a lifetime. 
Although our focus here today is on pay equity in relation to women, I'd like to add also that men of color in particular are affected by the wage gap in quite the same way as women. Men employed in female-dominated occupations also suffer from the same wage gap. Men across the board who are married to or live with working women suffer lower family and household income. Children are affected as well. Most children are supported by the income of at least one woman. 60% of working women earn about half or more of their family's income. 29% of working women earn all of their family's income. Both married and single mothers are working outside the home in record numbers. The poverty of mothers increases a child's chance of infant mortality, poor health, inadequate diet, low school achievement, high school dropout rate, unemployment, or underemployment as adults. And so we in this country, in this state, in this city, need to close the wage gap that persists between women and people of color. Equal pay for equal work must become the law of the land and enforced as such. And we commend the US House of Representatives for passing the Paycheck Fairness Act in July of this year and Senator Clinton and Congresswoman Maloney for their leadership in fighting to close this gap and in racial and gender pay equities that have held American women back. We urge the US Senate to support pay equity legislation and the Bush administration to enforce the laws already on the books. We applaud also the efforts of local coalitions like the Equal Pay Coalition of New York City, coordinated by the New York Women's Agenda and the New York City Council. Pay inequities undermine the economic well-being not only of families today, but they threaten the retirement security of women tomorrow. We should make this happen for all Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Marvel. We now turn to Sonia Osorio, President of New York City Now. Thank you so very much. I'm, it's a great pleasure. Um, and then Congressman Maloney have been champions of these issues, um, and we are very lucky to have them here in New York. Uh, you know, I work with, for the National Organization for Women. I'm the president here of the local chapter. And it always surprises me. I go to cocktail parties and people ask me, but aren't women equal? <laughs> it's quite clear, just from the little bit that we've discussed today, in one very, very important issue area, how much work there still needs to be done. We've talked about the pay inequity that exists between people of color and women and men. There's another area that we're just starting to talk about and that's the pay equity that exists for working mothers. You might have been hearing about maternal profiling. We've, we've done a lot of work in the area of racial profiling, and now we're talking about maternal profiling. There was a recent uh, test done where resumes uh, were sent in to companies where the, the women, it was indicated on there that you could tell that they were mothers, maybe you know, on their extracurricular, they were part of the PTA. 79% of the women did not get callbacks. This is a huge problem. For single mothers, the pay equity is 60 cents on the dollar. Is that supremely ironic when you think about these are the women who are out there working every day, raising and nurturing and taking care of our next generation of children? They're very serious issues and we need a political future that is gonna start talking more about the real issues that are affecting working mothers and their families. Um, do you know that the cost of childcare for two parent households is up to 17%. The cost of childcare for single mothers can eat up as much as 57% of their income. Many, many American families are struggling Many of you in here are tomorrow's leaders. I see many young faces, both male and female, and I hope all of you join together in this fight to take the information that you've learned today back to your schools, back to your friends. We've got to make this more of an issue. 
These are the issues we've got to be talking about in this upcoming very pivotal election. And for many of you, you're going to have many job opportunities, being graduating from a wonderful school. But still, the fact of the matter is you'll probably start your career making 80% of what your male colleagues makes. And those losses are only going to compound. So the personal advice that I can give you is to negotiate. And if you don't know how to do it, start thinking about it, start practicing. That's at least one way you can personally make a difference. So I want to thank you for having me here today. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work to, with you on these issues. Thank you. I, I have to personally thank you, Sonia, for, for touching on one of my favorite themes, what young women can learn in college to actually launch them better into a still male-dominated world. And we may ask you back to come teach negotiation skills, so watch out. Uh, in the meantime, it is my pleasure to give the podium to Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. As I'm sure you all know, Congresswoman Maloney has represented the 14th District here in New York since 1993. She has led the fight in Congress to expand paid parental leave and joined Senators Clinton and Harkin to request a new pay equity report from the GAO. Congresswoman Maloney. Thank, thank you so much, uh, President Deborah Spar. It is uh, always a great um, honor for me to be here at Barnard, uh, a school that has led and prepared women leaders since 1889. Two of your graduates are very active in my district, uh, Martha Stewart in finance and Judith Kay in the judiciary. <laughs> so uh, it's an outstanding school. And, and Barnard has always had a very close affiliation with Columbia. And we know that the Barnard graduates are going to achieve as much and perform as well as their male counterparts at Columbia. We are here today to work towards making sure that they are paid equally for that achievement with their male uh, colleagues. I, I am thrilled to be with so many outstanding uh, advocates and leaders that have advanced the women's causes. And I must mention that uh, all of these achievements are done with like-minded men. And uh, Danny O'Donnell, our, our state assemblyman, is here. And I wanted to recognize his presence along with uh, uh, Senator Clinton. <laughs> the largest single predictor of poverty in old age is being a mother. Uh, that speaks volumes about our social policies that the prior speakers were pointing out to and talking about. Uh, we know and have written about the feminization of poverty. And we know that when you discriminate against a woman, it then becomes her pension, it becomes her social security, and it becomes a never ending cycle of discrimination. And we are here to work towards trying to stop that. In 2003, John Dingle and I did a report on the glass ceiling that showed that there was a consistent 40% gap in uh, pay between men and women, 40%, for 20 years. And uh, after you factored in everything that could explain why there would be that, that gap, such as having children, taking care of parents, wanting flex time or whatever, there still was a 20% unexplained gap in, in wages. And uh, a woman should not have to work uh, 16 months to earn what men make in a year for doing the same work. And 40% of American women that are working are the sole providers for their family. Uh, the average is that uh, most women uh, working pay at least a third uh, of the salaries of the family. So it's not just a woman's issue, it, it's a man's issue, it's a family issue. And when you discriminate against a woman, you're discriminating against her children and her husband. And you are literally discriminating against uh, the, the, the growth of and possibility of helping uh, a society uh, move forward. So this is an important report that GAO has uh, produced at, at Hillary's request and my request and other members of Congress. And uh, this is something that is going to be taken up in the next uh, two weeks in Congress. We have passed the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act in the House of Representatives. It went to the Senate earlier this year and failed. 
We passed it uh, recently again. It is going over to the Senate. And uh, fortunately, our lioness is back on the job. <laughs> and uh, she is going to be in the Senate. And if I know Hillary, uh, hopefully this time we will be successful in passing a very important uh, piece of legislation. So it is now my honor to represent and, and to introduce the junior senator from New York, Hillary Rodham Clinton. And I, I just uh, I want to say that I, I just wrote a new book. It's called Rumors of Our Progress Are Greatly Exaggerated, Why Women's Lives Are Not Getting Any Easier. And I polled when this book came out what was important accomplishment of women in recent history. And the response was Hillary's race for the presidency. She earned 18 million votes. Uh, she conducted herself with uh, brilliance and humor and grace. And uh, I say she won the debates. And uh, all I can say is, Hillary, we are so very proud of you. Welcome our Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. pleasure to be here with all of you at this great college and you've already heard references to Barnard and Wellesley and you know those women's colleges. Um, I am a graduate of one obviously but I am uh, also a huge fan of the continuing role and necessity for um, women's colleges uh, even in close association uh, with a university like Columbia. So I'm grateful to be here uh, to join my voice with those uh, you've already heard. I want to thank President Spar. Uh, she, of course, has been on the job for 62 days and has really <laughs> taken hold because she understands, as her eloquent uh, remarks made clear, uh, that uh, we have a long way to go still. We've made an enormous amount of progress, but one of the most um, common occurrences to me during the many months I was on the campaign trail uh, was to have young women uh, express their belief that the concerns of my generation were no longer relevant, that equal pay was no longer an issue, that discrimination in the workplace or in society was passe. Uh, and I wish it were true, but unfortunately we have work to do and President Spar certainly understands that want to thank uh, Anna and Merble and Sonia for their advocacy and leadership. Uh, you have three of the great advocates on behalf of women and women's lives and certainly economic uh, justice uh, that you can find not just in our city or state but in our country. And it's wonderful to have uh, Danny here. Danny is a great champion for these causes uh, in the State Assembly. And the Equal Pay Coalition of New York City coordinated by uh, New York Women's Agenda has been instrumental in keeping uh, these issues alive and before the public. And of course, uh, Congresswoman Maloney uh, has been our champion uh, ever since she arrived in Congress. And her book is really worth looking at uh, because I'm, I'm putting in a shameless plug for it, Carolyn. Uh, <laughs> because there were forgotten that are still a problem, and I highly recommend it to all the women's studies and uh, economic uh, uh, professors here and others. You know, we've already heard the statistic, and we know the challenge that women face. And I think it's always a surprise in New York City for us to admit that despite the dynamism and vibrancy of the opportunities available here, that unfortunately women, particularly women of color, and particularly mothers, are not getting their fair share for the work they do. Often putting in very long hours at difficult jobs and not bringing home enough money to lift themselves and their children uh, out of poverty and into the middle class. This is not, as Carolyn said, an issue just for women. That's often the way it's portrayed, and that's a real injustice. This is an issue for men, for children, for families, 
but it also really goes to the heart of who we are as a nation. You know, we pride ourselves on being a meritocracy, on having equal rights before the law, and yet the Equal Pay Act, which was passed in 1963, has never been adequately enforced. That's why on Equal Pay Day last year, Congresswoman Maloney and I and others of our colleagues you know, called on the nonpartisan government watchdog, the Government Accountability Office, to investigate the performance of the federal government in closing the wage gap. And we now have the results. And the GAO report is a ringing indictment of the Bush administration. The GAO found that the Bush administration, through the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which under President Bush has become an oxymoron, does not effectively monitor enforcement of laws on the books to prevent pay discrimination. EEOC offices are not investigating cases of unequal pay for equal work. The office charged with preventing pay discrimination among federal contractors allows most contractors to investigate themselves to determine if a pay gap exists. And the GAO found that the administration does not even bother to monitor whether or not the government contractors are taking this meager step. Not enough is being done to prevent your taxpayer dollars from being used by government contractors to pay women less for doing the same job. I find that, unfortunately, not surprising from this administration. The Bush administration's actions speak far louder than their words. They have basically been silent on this issue, and they are not interested in talking about it or acting to remedy it. So the administration basically adopted a policy that defies common sense, um, asking people to investigate themselves. And that has not closed the wage gap. Now, we can continue the policies of this president uh, and his allies in the Congress and do nothing, or we can choose a new course. And we need to do everything we can to toughen the laws and pass new laws. That's why in the Senate, I've introduced the Paycheck Fairness Act. Uh, Car Carolyn Maloney was a great champion of this act. It did pass the House. It came over to the Senate. We faced a filibuster from the Republicans. Uh, we were unable to break that filibuster. We didn't have the 60 votes necessary uh, to pass the uh, uh, Lilly Ledbetter Act, which would close part of the gap, and we're worried about taking up the Paycheck Fairness Act. So we're going to demand that the Department of Labor develop a plan to sharpen the tools to stop pay discrimination and do everything we can to remedy this wrong, which we have been talking about and had laws to prevent going back, as I said, to 1963. Now, I would be remiss if I did not also address an issue that will affect New York and fall disproportionately on women once again, and that is the financial crisis that we confront today. Now, many of you have been following the latest market volatility with great concern, and we've seen the financial landscape on Wall Street reshaped literally overnight. And titans of finance uh, rendered insolvent, bankrupt, or bought uh, at a very low price. There are a lot of questions we're going to have to answer and details to sort through in the days ahead. But I'm concerned about the thousands and thousands of New Yorkers whose jobs are threatened today. You know, we see the faces of the leaders of these financial services firms that are so important to the economy of New York, and they are men. But backing them up, doing the work day by day to keep that organization running are thousands of women. And both the women and the men working for the financial services industry are now facing some very tough times. For too long, the Bush administration dismissed and even derided those of us who believed that our economy was at risk. They pursued a logical agenda. More and more power in the hands of firms that use that power to take enormous financial risks with little oversight or accountability. I have warned the Bush administration, along with many others, repeatedly that decisive action was needed to get at the root 
cause of this financial instability. We needed to help people stay in their homes in order to stave off a deepening crisis across the economy. I was ignored. When the crisis began to hit Main Street, the administration was missing in action. I called for greater involvement of the Federal Housing Administration to help borrowers and proposed a freeze on foreclosures as well as a moratorium on rising subprime rates. I went to Wall Street last December and called for greater accountability and responsibility as well as action to stem the credit crisis. Now some have said that no one could see this coming. Some have said that the markets are too big, risk too diversified, investments too sophisticated to allow financial disaster. And even when working families begin to feel the pain of the downturn in the markets, um, most uh, observers thought that the big financial institutions would stay one step ahead of disaster. Well, it wasn't until the crisis hit Wall Street that the administration finally decided to act. And unfortunately, their actions have been haphazard and reactive at best. Americans are deeply concerned and even a little bewildered. But I want you to know there are things we can do right now. We can restore confidence. We can act to stem this crisis. Uh, we can take steps to shore up our economy and prevent a downward spiral. But we need to end the ideological policies that set the stage for this crisis and the lack of action that allowed the crisis to deepen. We need to take bold, comprehensive steps to ensure that we are preventing the crisis from damaging our economy further and putting more and more hardworking middle class families at jeopardy. While the largest bankers in the world can have closed door meetings with the White House and the Treasury Department and the Federal Reserve to discuss their bailout options, millions of homeowners with mortgages that are becoming increasingly unaffordable and have mortgages that are actually worth more than their home equity are facing default and foreclosure and they don't have the same opportunity. I think it's past time for them to be heard. I have called before and I'm calling again for the president to convene an economic summit with the Congress, the economic leadership, the groups involved in this market, whether they're lenders, homeowner, consumer groups, nonprofits or others. We've got everybody on page. We are on one team, the American team. And the team is in a fourth quarter down and not able to figure out how we're going to get across the goal line together. It's clear that for too long, the rapid ev evolution of the securities and banking industry overwhelmed our regulatory framework, resulting in, entire, in an entire shadow banking system that operated outside of oversight and not accountable to anyone. Risky, dangerous, multi-billion dollar transactions that fueled the subprime crisis and the current credit crisis threatens to take our entire financial system down. So we need new regulations that are in keeping with the global economic challenges of the 21st century. I'm highlighting again the need for more lenders to work with borrowers to rework the terms of their mortgages. We are dealing with the symptoms. As dangerous and threatening as these symptoms are, we are not yet getting to the root cause. President Spar and I talked very briefly before we came in, and uh, we have faced very difficult financial problems in the past, most acutely during the Great Depression. We had a home equity crisis then, uh, like we do now, negative equity, mortgages that continue to outpace the value of the home. We need a government system to work out mortgage modifications. And we need to make sure we have legal support to do that, because you all know what has happened. You enter into a mortgage. It is sold many times over. It is held by someone half a world away. We have to make sure that if you work to modify those terms, you are not legally liable, and that will require congressional action. I think mortgage modifications and workouts can be beneficial to the lender and the borrower and can stop the bleeding caused by foreclosures. I've introduced legislation to remove the barriers to mortgage modifications, and uh, I hope that we will take that up. This is one of the most difficult financial crises we have faced as a country. 
but I am absolutely confident that we can meet it. There isn't any reason why we should be paralyzed or wringing our hands or watch the situation deteriorate further. We need leadership from the public and the private sector. And I'm hoping that uh, now that everyone's attention is focused on what has happened, uh, that leadership will be forthcoming. You know, pay equity is a critical issue, but having the jobs underlying that pay equity is absolutely essential. And where we are right now with a declining job picture and with a financial crisis and with the credit crunch that prevents businesses from growing and hiring means that we have a perfect storm. And it's going to take some uh, careful navigation, but there's no reason why our ship of state should not find our way to a safe harbor. And uh, I hope that we will uh, understand that turning this economy around is in everyone's interest, not just those whose pictures are on the front page of our paper, but the people who work in those institutions and tens of millions more who, whether they know it or not, are dependent upon the decisions that are made with respect to them. So I'm grateful to um, my colleagues here for highlighting such an important problem as pay equity, one that uh, I care passionately about. Uh, but I think right now we have to add our concern about jobs in New York and the future of the financial services industry and the necessity uh, for this government to step in. Hopefully come January we will have a new team and we will be able to address this problem in a a realistic way. We did it uh, before and we can do it again, but I don't think we can wait. Therefore, I'm urging that we take action now and certainly we'll do whatever I can working across the aisle uh, to come to some resolution about how best to uh, handle the problems that we face. Thank you all very much. Questions about pay equity or the economy, uh, first and foremost? Yes. Senator Clinton, what do you think Senator Obama needs to do to secure more women voters? Um, especially as we talk about pay equity, also Senator Obama is now come back on the campaign trail. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are going to be secure. Well, I think what we're doing today and what Senator Obama has been talking about on the campaign trail, uh, the issue of pay equity is. Uh, you know, one of the stark differences between him and Senator McCain. Senator McCain has never been in favor of the laws that many of us have championed for years to make sure we close that wage gap. And I've campaigned for Senator Obama in Florida and, and Nevada and New Mexico. I was yesterday in Ohio. I always talk about pay equity because it is a clear distinction between the Republican ticket and our Democratic ticket. And so let's emphasize these economic issues, these health care issues, the kinds of issues that keep you up late at night and put you know, a pain in the middle of your stomach during the day because you're worried and you don't know what's going to happen. And we clearly have seen eight years of failed economic stewardship and disinterest and indifference to the consequences of those failed policies on the lives of uh, men and women. So I'm hoping that uh, People really look hard at what the difference is here. Good follow up. What about for the younger generation? I mean, a, a lot of the younger women don't understand that pay actually still exists. So, what can you do to kind of propel that forward? Well, what we're doing today, coming here to such a great uh, college and talking about uh, this issue, getting the word out. I see a lot of uh, young journalists uh, getting the word out to. Uh, your peers that uh, this is not your mother's problem. Uh, it actually is a current challenge uh, to young women. And talking about the state of the economy. Uh, so many young people are wondering, you know, what jobs are going to be there? Uh, you know, I, I know that in the last several years, a lot of very talented young men and women have flooded into Wall Street. Well, they have a big stake in having a president who will put into place the appropriate structures for regulation that will make our free market economy work effectively, but with adequate oversight and accountability for the complexity of finance in today's world. So I think this all connects up, and young people 
uh, need to pay attention as they are to this election because clearly you have a bigger stake than uh, people my age. And uh, Senator Obama understands that and is, you know, talking about it uh, on the campaign trail. Yes. Can you uh, scan a poll release today showing that Senator Obama is only five points ahead of Senator McCain in New York? Do you think it's possible that New York could go to McCain? No. And I, and I don't think. <laughs> I, 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 do, I, do, I do not think that uh, is a, an accurate reflection. Certainly uh, not based on, you know, my conversation and travel. Uh, you know, I was in uh, Rome and Albany earlier today, and uh, I think New York understands as well as any place in our country how desperately we need to uh, uh, change direction. And we cannot do it if you have uh, more Republicans with the same attitude and policies that have been such a uh, disaster for our, our nation in the last uh, eight years. Yeah. Well, on the Paycheck uh, Fairness Act, um, as you know, it passed in the House, and it was sent over to the Senate, um, but we haven't voted on it yet because we are not sure we can beat their filibuster. I mean, that's one of the biggest headaches we have uh, on the other side of Capitol Hill. Uh, we don't have a big enough majority, and the House has passed some great legislation, which comes to the Senate and dies because we can't get 60 votes. Um, so we are seeing whether we can't put together those votes. We fell short, as I said, on the Lilly Ledbetter Act, um, but we're gonna keep trying. We only have about two weeks left, uh, but I assume we'll have a lame duck session, and then of course I'm counting on the fact that we not only have a Democratic president, but we have more Democratic senators to help us make sure we can pass this progressive legislation. Um, your second question about the, uh, the... What would you be doing today in the economic crisis? Well, I would have answered the phone, and I'm not sure <laughs> President Bush did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had this ideological mindset in this administration, um, which has basically ignored the dangers to our economy in favor of a hands-off approach thinking that somehow this would all work out, and it hasn't. And therefore, I would be convening the kind of economic summit that I referenced. I think you need to get everybody in the room. Uh, as I said, you know, the Treasury and the Fed met all weekend with the heads of our, our biggest financial institutions. Uh, but I think we should bring in other actors, other people with a stake in what's going to happen going forward. I would be presenting legislation to uh, make loan modification uh, easier and remove liability if uh, it were to be negotiated. I would be looking for a uh, revamped uh, regulatory structure. I would unleash the SEC, which seems to have been on a very long vacation, uh, un involved in what has been going on in uh, the uh, markets. And you know, we have to come up with a framework of accountability uh, that uh, suits our times, just as a previous uh, generation of leaders did during the Great Depression. We've, we've lived off of that framework, but it's no longer adequate for what we face in a global economy. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, and I would be working day and night to get that uh, hammered out, because at the end of, you're coming to the end of the term, here you see what a difference leadership makes. Um, you know, President Bush inherited a balanced budget and a surplus, and he's going to leave us the biggest deficit we've ever had. Uh, he inherited uh, an economy that was creating tens of millions of jobs, and he has the worst job creation record of any administration uh, since the Great Depression. So I believe that the evidence is clear that uh, this administration is unlikely to take the action that I would like to see them do, but I'm going to keep pushing them until the last day they're in, because I don't think we can wait. Well, there's so much that needs to be done, but you know, you, the, but a lot of that has to be worked out uh, with the Treasury and the Fed uh, and the financial uh, services uh, businesses themselves. 
Uh, we're gonna, you know, the, you, you read the paper, we know we've got some other problems that are on the brink and I think we should be looking for ways to try to resolve them short of collapses and loss of more jobs and, you know, frankly, undermining our economic standing in the world. I, I thought it was, you know, somewhat telling that uh, the IMF is discussing whether they should uh, examine the American economy. Uh, and if you look at uh, the statistics about our debt position and our deficit and uh, what's happening in our financial markets and our credit crunch and all the other indicators, uh, there's some argument that uh, unfortunately that may be uh, uh, a position that uh, they can justify. Thanks. Last question. Oh, too many hands. I can't possibly <laughs> answer. Well, I'll, I'll, here, I'll, this young woman there, yes. Well, first make sure that your own institution um, engages in pay equity, <laughs> which I imagine we do here. Um, but I think what President Spar said is very um, important. Uh, I have on my website, uh, my Senate website, a uh, uh, discussion about how, young, how women negotiate their pay and talking about some of the tips that you should be uh, following because it is still the case that uh, uh, many young women who enter the workforce don't have any idea what a financial disadvantage they start out at. And it only gets worse as it uh, compounds over time. Uh, and I think we have to change the laws, we have to make sure our own institutions live up to our, our values, but individuals also need to be uh, much more vigorous in uh, looking out for your own financial interests and asking the hard questions and holding uh, your employers to account. You know, some of you may have seen Lily Ledbetter speak. You know, she worked at a tire factory all those years. She had no idea she was being paid less uh, for doing the same job until toward the end of her career and somebody anonymously put a pay stub. And in fact, it was grounds for firing if you asked your fellow employees how much you made. Uh, so we've got to uh, open up uh, the world of uh, pay decisions to more transparency and then young women have to be willing to really go after their own interests and stand up for uh, their right to be paid what they should be paid. Uh, and uh, I, I think it's, it's a combination of a lot of different steps we need to take. Yes? You know, I am uh, focusing on the issues that separate us. Um, you know, what matters to me is that the McCain-Palin ticket is against pay equity, that the McCain-Palin ticket has never supported uh, the kind of uh, changes legislatively that Carolyn and I have fought for, uh, that the McCain-Palin uh, ticket want to continue the economic policies that have proven uh, so uh, damaging to hardworking Americans and to our financial uh, system. So, I mean, there's a long list of reasons why uh, the McCain-Palin ticket is not in the best interests of Americans, and uh, I'm going to keep drawing those contrasts because that's what people um, are thinking about when they make up their decision to vote. Yes? Yeah, when it comes to either the labor market or the financial system, is, it, is the problem an inadequate regulatory framework or lax enforcement? And if it's lax enforcement, then that raises a more serious question. I mean, what can, for example, you do in Congress? Well, no, I think it's both. I think it's both. I think the, you know, and Carolyn, come up here, is on the, on the committee in, in, in uh, the House that uh, manages this. We don't have adequate regulatory um, boundaries for uh, the hedge funds, for others that are engaged in massive transactions that are both onshore and offshore. We don't know what, wealth, what sovereign wealth funds are doing. I mean, we have all these new actors in the global economy and we our, our regulatory system is not up to understanding what to do uh, about them and then the other side of the coin is we don't adequately enforce the rules that we do have uh, Carolyn you want to add something I, I would just like to say that the subprime crisis was really the root of, of many of these uh, problems and Chairman Bernanke has said we will not move forward on a sound economy until we solve our housing crisis uh, we have passed in the House and the Senate a bill that brings everyone under a regulatory structure in the housing market. The, the challenge, the problems really came from the unregulated uh, mortgage brokers. Most of these, they, they would just take, uh, give out a mortgage, then 
sell it and move on and go to Florida as opposed to others that were regulated and held responsible. They came out with a guidance from the Fed finally that basically said you don't hand out a mortgage to someone who can't pay for it. This is Finance 101, but if you had followed that basic rule, you would never have gotten into that problem. I left a, a meeting earlier today with uh, Chairman Frank, and over the weekend there was an economic forum on the challenges at, at Princeton. We went into the eco economic forum thinking we had four uh, major investment banks in New York, and uh, today we woke up and we have two left. Uh, so uh, there has been testimony before the Financial Services Committee from both uh, Chairman Paulson and from Chairman Bernanke uh, really calling for a change in the whole regulatory framework. Uh, when the Fed opened up its discount window to investment banks and had a backstop to Bear Stern, uh, which I totally supported. We put in a $29 billion backstop, which they did not use, which kept them from the contagion from unraveling. But I must tell you, it was not a popular decision in Congress uh, from Main Street and many other people. So we need to really do a better work here in New York, a better job in New York, uh, talking about how how really giving a backstop to some of these uh, companies will uh, really uh, help uh, move us forward in, in a more uh, solid way. Uh, we know that uh, AIG, a major uh, New York company, is now under threat. Uh, the governor of uh, New York, Governor Patterson, has come out and said he will put a $20 billion backstop uh, for AIG but wants uh, federal support. That will be among the questions that we will be addressing and working uh, uh, towards uh, when we go back uh, to Washington uh, later on tonight. But uh, it, it is a huge uh, challenge. Uh, I, I, uh, President Spar was telling me she was a, a professor on, the, on the, uh, uh, the Great Depression, as is Bernanke, and uh, this is certainly the, the, most, uh, the greatest challenge we've had uh, to our financial framework since I for uh, more regulation. If you're going to give a backstop, it, then you, you need to be regulated, and and this whole hands-off approach that the Bush administration has, uh, has really advocated, even uh, right up to today, probably, probably continue, well, that you just let, let the markets by themselves. Well, the markets are not functioning by themselves. They're coming to government to help them uh, provide the confidence that they uh, need to turn some of these things around. We, we have a lot of work to do, Hillary. We should go back to our offices. <laughs> Thank you all for